Hi, John. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, thank you for accepting my invitation to be in this little chat. Um, I watched you with um, Robert Saltzman in um, The Gathering and I really liked uh, what you had to say. Um, I felt that you were really truthful to yourself and that it was coming um, innately for you. And um, I especially liked what you had to say about Toto and um, uh, the Wizard of Oz. That's the guy who pulled the curtain. And um, can you tell us um, your story about um, what was found behind the curtain when Toto pulled, pulled it down? 50 years ago, I turned in, I called it turning inside out, like a bud of a flower opening and turning inside out. Uh, there's too much to explain in trying to communicate the experience of that, but I wasn't prepared. I did, wasn't a spiritual person, uh, just an ordinary guy. And I'd never heard of non-duality or any of this stuff. So in my sharing that with folks, depending on who I would share it with, whether it was a preacher, a Christian preacher, or someone who was reading Alan Watts, they would take that and try to brand my insight with whatever that school of thought was. So the first person that I met who was seemed to be aware of the turning inside out was an illiterate man in the mountains of Jamaica. And he, he never read anything, didn't know how to read. But he affirmed that turning inside out with his words, which was I and I one love. And he lived it with me. He invited me to live with him in the mountains for a winter in, in Jamaica, and he built me a, a bamboo hut, and we lived out of the wild, and he would forage food uh, to eat, and that was my first mentor or equal in hanging out with another person who had turned inside out. And it was a sheer joy. Um, I had people, friends of mine, who would come to visit in the mountains there. And one was a, a, uh, a young man who had been attracted by this young guru from India, Guru Maraji, who was the kid guru who came over. This was 45, 50 years ago. And he stayed briefly in the camp and, and had to go run back to the United States to see the kid guru. And I think I told this story on the on the Nothing Dudes yeah. program. <laughs> yes, uh, I've, yes, I've heard that. <laughs> but 
uh, he told the story of a little doggy with a with a hunting for a bone who wanted so much to find the bone and and uh, the doggy searched and searched and searched and searched and finally found the bone and and he he grabbed the bone in his mouth like this. And he was such a happy fun. And James, he was animating this, telling the little story. And so the, the dog was running and prancing around so happy with the bone he had. And he came following the street. The still in the room. Without about it, he noticed a bone reflection in the still pool and went for the bone. But James, he continued the story that the dog continued, got back searching, he was really frightened that he had lost the bone. He was searching and searching and searching. Still pool in the stream that was that he found a bone. He found a bone, and he came to another still pool in the stream. And he looked in the stream, and James he cocked his head and looked up with an eye, and he held on to the bone. He saw it was a reflection. So that's a story that stayed with me, that little, that little story. I saw lots of people looking for a bone. Many would find a bone. They would meet their reflection in a guru or a book or whatever, and they would drop their bone. And usually the guru or whatever would come in and brand that bone with their word. It might be a, a Muktananda or Ramana Maharshi or some word that they would brand that insight and take that away from the person and hold it hostage. Giving back a doctrine of sin or some cosmology that would lock them into a holy hierarchy. Over and over and over again, I saw it. And I had the, almost like the Forrest Gump movie, I started meeting these people backstage and I saw it up close. And I got real stories of people, how ordinary they were, these ordinary human beings. Not to discount the true reflections that were profound, but they were reflections, not an other. Uh, so I'm an ordinary guy. I never got into the spiritual business uh, wasn't attracted to it. Um, I've been in the food business. I've been very successful as a food entrepreneur. I uh, have a wonderful life. I have a, a wife of 40 some years. We're just happy as can be. Got a nice squat spot. Everything's good. Everything's good. And uh, so uh, that's kind of my story. Uh, so you're saying, um, John, do you think that um, people you've seen after you, you, you saw your Jamaican guy, um, you've seen more teachers afterwards, um, I presume. Um, has any of that helped you think in, in any way? I understand you did not read and you're so-called teacher has not read anything and same here like I did not read anything before I went to see my teacher 
I read I'm that afterwards when I did not need to read it just to see um, because I was confused um, it was a new world to me all of a sudden and um, I was like with reading I'm that everything felt like home um, and um, yeah basically I did not need to read anything but and, and I needed a few meetings um, because um, I understood what Nisargadatta used to say. He said, um, eight meetings are enough and um, get lost, don't come back because he was not asking for followers, Nisargadatta. But I find that not many are like Nisargadatta or Ramana like that because they allow people to come back to the meetings for whatever reason. And um, can you tell me, do you feel, we don't know this probably, but do you feel that um, any of that seeking has helped in any way? Or um, that, I understand that story stayed with you. It's really a beautiful story with the dog when he saw it's his own reflection, meaning that's it, this is me, this is here. Um, and um, yeah, has it helped at all, like seeking? What I found with people was an affirmation. The first thing I read was Alan Watts a little book called This Is It. And when I read that, it was, I said, yeah, I hear that. Uh, I met Swami Muktananda. I don't know if you know of him. Yeah. But I met Swami Muktananda and we had the same sense of being turned inside out. When I met him, I saw an equal, not, not a hierarchy. So I never joined anything or became a part of it, but I had, as fate would allow, incredible access where I, could, I spent a good bit of time with him. I had many as, as psychedelic as what would be happening with me seemed to be happening with him simultaneously. My final, my final meeting with Muktananda, it was about a seven year period. Was in, at his ashram in upstate New York. And I had earned the nickname Wizard. A friend of mine had asked me to help develop a character in a musical drama he was writing to develop the character of a wizard. And so I did, and we did skits. And my wife had made a wizard hat. Knowing that Muktananda liked hats, I thought I'd give him the hat because I thought he was a wizardly kind of guy on his last night, it was his last night in America before going back to India. So I went to, to New York with a friend of mine, uh, walked into the ashram. We met coming in into the building. We met, acknowledged one another. He walked, he walked in, I walked in, there was a, a fairly large group of people there for his final night before he left. Roberta Flack was there with her band. 
they, she had uh, her band in there performing Killing Me Softly. She sang it to Baba and dedicated the song to him that evening. So other dignitaries spoke and then it came time to say the last goodbye to him before he left. I'm a little shy, so I was last in line holding the hat. So as I was waiting it in was line, right. a section of life got edited out and the two pieces of the film got sliced back together without any time going past. I was on the other side of the room. The room only had a few stragglers left in the room. The hat was beside me on the floor under this Hindu statue. It seemed to be pouring a cornucopia of stuff over the top of it. And I looked up and Roberta Flack was walking straight at me, looking me in the eye. She said, put that hat back on. And I said, I feel silly. She said, put that hat back on. The master put it on your head. You're to wear it. I asked her what happened. I didn't know what happened. She said, I, the, the master had put, I came up, I was last in line, and he had a real playful time with me. And everybody was hooting, and it was a real blast and everything. And then afterwards, you walked over here. And I walked up to you. Because I don't remember any of it. None of it. Very strange. It was like getting anesthesia. If you've ever been put to sleep, yeah. it, it was, there's no duration. It was just clip, clip, splice back together again. Yeah. I didn't know what it was or what to call it. Baba went back to India and died a few days later. That was his last trip, my last visit with him. In talking to others through the years since then and sharing that experience, I was informed that I had had what was called a nervo okay. And I said, what is that? I said, it's a samadhi <clears throat> where there's nothing left. And that was the big takeaway. Other experiences were experience. This was not an experience. No different than going under anesthesia, deep sleep, or before, forever before being born. The takeaway is that it's profoundly benign like sleep. Nothing is profoundly benign. Also, time is just a function of consciousness. Outside of consciousness, time is not. So when I hear someone like Nasargadatta speak what he calls absolute, I wouldn't call it absolute. I hear that. Or if I hear Ramana talk about Taria, I hear that, I understand that. Or if he describes it with sleep or whatever, I understand that, the fourth state. So, and it's not an experience. The other so-called samadhis, <clears throat> I didn't know all the words for them, 
but they were all there, all, all the phenomena, all of that flowers blooming, beautiful, a marvel, no doubt. But they all happened with me naturally. It just happened. It wasn't a result of my doing anything at all. None of it. Didn't, didn't get into it. Never practiced meditation or anything like that. Uh, later I met a person, his name was Sridhar. And he's a Sarod player, best Sarod player in the world, travels the world. Worked with, in the Peter Gabriel, out of the Peter Gabriel studio in the UK. He invited me to India for a month. He said he'd spend the time with me. And he's streetwise. So we went to India. I said, he's going to take me by Muktananda's ashram. When we got there, it was a big side bigger than a coffin plexiglass cube with a slot in the top of it, half full of money, where people would come and walk around and empty their pockets and pour all the money in it. Uh, we, went to, we went to several places. Papa G had invited me over to dinner at his, at his little bungalow. I went, I took Sridhar with me. Simple man in the kitchen, watching TV. It was strange, but they had this little room built onto the living room, like a gallery where the people were gawking. They had people sitting in there gawking and him being an ordinary person, like, like the scene like his ordinary life was a set on TV. It was friendly, down home. He invited Sridhar and I back the next day for a satsang he was gonna give. We went, we went the next day he said, I'll have a place reserved for you in the front line. And we, we got there, there was a big crowd there. David Godman had the camera set up and everything. They had a table out front selling books and trinkets and pictures and, and everything. And, and people were, were arming each other, elbowing each other to see how close they could get to him and everything. And my friend and I looked at one another and we just got up and laughed. It was ridiculous. So I'm seeing backstage that it's an enterprise. It's a brand. Uh, it, it's a business. And they're like ordinary people. Yes. Mm. I was in a room with Muktananda one time and they had in the hall, they were all chanting and going through all the ceremony and he says, none of that matters. Just love one another, that's all, that's all there is to it. None of that matters. So, in, I've noticed that when people come to these still pools or whatever is affirming 
what their own blooming, their own insight, they tend to drop the bone and they're gonna to have to go look for it again. And the brand comes in and exploits that search over and over and over again. Muji is a classic example of it. It's no different than even born again evangelicals. They have a, a, a blooming and experience or something and Jesus comes in and takes the credit. And the priest class comes in and starts to dictate how to live your life. So I tried it. I would find an affirmation, go wow. Then see the truth of it over and over again. I discovered that exhausting all those remedies, these imaginary remedies for an imaginary disease is the remedy. And you exhaust them all, you, you, you're left with yourself. You're left with the residuum. So this, the seeking and the gain serves its own purpose and exhausting those remedies, if that's an inclination. I like Ramana Maharshi. I had read this book called Talks almost 50 years ago. And that resonated with what I had gone through, what my own turning inside out. But if I got the Hindu words out of it and everything, it was spot on. But I took out all the visionary stuff and the mountain and all of that stuff. It just so happened that I got to be friends with his nephew. His name is Ganesh. Yeah. He's still alive. We got to be for about 10 years really good friends. We traveled together, spent time in one another's homes, really, really enjoyed one another's company. He didn't mind if I ate meat or whatever, or drank or smoked pot or did whatever. Everything was cool. We, had, we just had a good time. I asked him numerous times, was your uncle an ordinary human being? Every time he would say, yes, John, he was an ordinary human being. Ultimately, he wanted to put his life's work in a book, but he didn't trust the ashram there. And he didn't trust these local people called Aham, A-H-A-M. He appeared at my door one day with a stack of manuscripts and papers and a handwritten letter and said, would you take these and, and get them in a book for me? I said, sure, I'll try. I'm not a book guy, but I'll, I, have, I have resources that I can use. So in, in, in the book in the forward, I'm, I'm, I quote him saying that his uncle is an ordinary human being. That gets out. The family is outraged. That ends our relationship, a 10 year relationship. Because that secret was shared because the motivation confessed to me was that his brothers, Ganesha's brothers, were into running a museum as curators of a museum and wanted to attract people to the museum. They were well-intended, 
but the notion was to build up Ramana as a messiah. And part of that was going into the archives and cleaning out all the ordinary human stuff. And you could write a book about your life or any life and edit out all the ordinary stuff and take all the little good stuff and put it together and we'd read like Ramana Maharshi. It's just editing. You edit out all the other ordinary stuff. It's in there. I mean, they get five years in a, in, in a few hundred pages. That's not a lot. And you take a Brahmin caste translating a Southern Indian language with that spin on it. Ganeshan was the one who typed the book up when, when he got back from school, got it into print. It goes through these filters and gets out there as a book, as a classic, but it's only such a small little fraction of, of an ordinary life that when you expand that over the span of time, the imagination, the reflection of, of what you're getting affirmed gets expanded out into some kind of holy storyline. It's lost that ordinariness. And the you, people put the woo-woo on it. And here, here's another Bible. Here's another book that any of us if someone's following you around for five years and you're writing down everything you say and then edits it all down to all the good stuff, you'd read like Ramana Maharshi too. So exhausting those remedies, being able to look backstage has helped me, has, has helped me not to see a, ref a reflection, a beautiful reflection of another human being, but I can't really, it's not that other human being I'm ever experiencing, it's always myself, always. I can't experience another person, whether it's Muktananda, or I can't experience a dead person, Ramana Maharshi, I can imagine I'm getting some sort of darshan because it could be so deep and beautiful, et cetera. But self-hypnotism is real, very, very real and very powerful. It could be a wonderful placebo in, in, in times of, of suffering or strife, but it's still just me. All that I see is just me. Yes, and um, I liked when Robert Saltzman said, he said, please do not trust me, test anything I say. And my teacher also, Bob Adamson, used to say, um, test it for yourself, you know, like similar. And that's exactly um, how I felt, um, you know. People think they, sh they um, should spend the rest of their lives in the meetings or, or satsangs. But basically, um, they take that message. The point is to grab that message and run, live your life be as a, an ordinary being. But um, to me, it seems that um, most of these people, they live in this la-la land, believing um, they should all be messengers. They want to be important. They, they love their own voice. And everyone wants to talk about it. They just, everyone wants to become a teacher. It doesn't work that way. You know, a few people might, you know, be messengers, pass the message on, but don't put yourself on, on pedestal. And because that way, I think you do the damage to yourself and you do the damage to the seekers because they expect some tr transmission I understand that, that Muktananda's message was also great and because Bob stayed with, with Muktananda and Kalyani and Peter Lowry that um, live here, also Bob's, Bob's students that live in Melbourne, they all went to see Muktananda. And Bob said to me, Muktananda's message was similar to Nisargadatta's. 
but he said, I never actually heard it. I've heard it when Mr. Gadato said it. He said, um, you know, you are not the body, you're not the mind, you are absolute awareness. And it just stayed with him. Anyway, what Mr. Gadato said to him, he just trusted him. He heard it for the first time. So uh, can we, uh, John, decide when we really hear this message or do we have any say in this? Um, or does the message get, get heard by itself at its own accord, you know? For me, the messages were after the fact. They were affirmations. So, like, I would get a message always after an insight that would articulate that insight, but the messages wouldn't precipitate an insight. I may have an aha, but every time I had an aha, I realized it was my own common sense being articulated and put into words. I knew it all along. I just didn't know how to say it. So every aha to me is an affirmation of common sense, not something that came in and fixed me. So basically it was with you. Um, you. You just recognized that that message was with you. The insights were coming through you and um, basically got recognized, recognized at its own accord. Um, but you had, no one had the say in it. And uh, I, I did say it a few times, I said, um, because understanding came here that um, I said, I could have had this Nisargadatta and Ramana and my teacher and everyone together if if I wasn't hearing it, if if the readiness was there, maybe all the life suffering perhaps, there was enough suffering for this openness to happen in a way. That's how I seen that um, because I was not interested in spirituality ever. I was actually against it. I never meditated. I um, I did not like the word spiritual. <laughs> and uh, but um, I was asked. Um, someone took me there, you know. And um, yeah, I sat in the meetings about uh, dozens of meetings, and that was enough. But um, I wasn't hanging with spiritual people. Um, I just. Each time meeting finished, I would just run away and people asked me to stay for lunch. I was like, no, I just wanted to get out because I was hearing what my teacher was saying. Get the message and go, you know, take it, like implement it, take it on board and leave it because you are that already, you know, what you're seeking. And so many are sitting there repeating that for 30 years. Could be the same teacher, could be Ramana, could be Nisargadatta. But if, if you're not hearing it innately, if you hear it with your mind, it just does not work, I feel. And I like what Alan Watts said. He said, people steal your watch and they sell you your own watch. That's what many of these teachers do, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Most yeah. teachers are teachers of becoming. Yeah, seems. you can't, there are no copies. We're each, in, we're all individual and unique flowers blooming in our own way. And uh, one flower can't copy another flower's DNA. It's not how nature works. We're all different. No, no carbon copies. If you're looking to repeat somebody else's experience, you'll be looking a long time.
you know, uh, what I like saying also is like, be a even a bad, bad original rather than a good copy. Because that um, parroting and repeating doesn't do good to anyone. You're just tricking yourself. You don't, you're not tricking anyone else, you know? If you're repeating what you learned through the years intellectually. Because Nisargadatta said in, you know, intellect is not it. It's, um, yeah, it's not about the intellect. It's not about the knowledge. There's nothing to get. There's nothing to, to that, that your mind can grab hold of and get. So um, when Toto pulled the curtain, what was behind it? An ordinary human being. And it, it's interesting. L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, he was actually a member of the Theosophical Society with his wife and mother-in-law. They got him to got him in to yeah. that. Frank Baum mm -hmm. wrote that story about the same time that Ramana ran away from his uncle's house, ran away from home. He dropped out of school. He ran away from home. At about that time, that's when Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz, about that same time. Yeah. The takeaway from that little fable is you had it all along even though you searched and searched and searched and went to the great wizard of Oz, you had it all along. And part of that, that little fable that's so endearing is the little dog. And the little dog, Frank Baum, characterized intuition as the little puppy. He actually had a little dog like Toto. So he, he characterized his little critter pal in the, in the story that couldn't be fooled. So when everybody else was amazed at the stagecraft and the stage name of the Great Wizard of Oz and the story of the Great Wizard of Oz, the little puppy pulls a curtain back to reveal it's just Professor Marvel, the snake hole salesman in the story, not the great Wizard of Oz. That was profoundly empowering to pull that curtain back. Only then in this fable did Professor Marvel then approach Dorothy and her comrades and affirmed what they already had. The lion had the courage, the scarecrow had the smarts. The tin man had a brain, had a heart. The tin man had a heart. And they all had lived this in their search. So Professor Marvel gave them an award that said, this is for real, it gave them the diploma but he said you had it all along. Ramana Maharshi's takeaway is exactly the same. Be as you are, you had it all along. One day you'll wake up and laugh at all your past efforts. Same takeaway, no different. The movie, The Wizard of Oz, has reached the multitudes. It's the most watched movie in human history. Even today, more people have seen that fable and know the story than will ever, ever, ever know of Ramana Maharshi. Yet, no one 
has made a Messiah out of anybody or made a religion out of any of it. It's just a fable. Religions and spirituality think they own the territory and they don't. It's expressed in things like fables and story and dance and song and so many different facets of society that it's really arrogant for these spiritual guides and gurus to try to claim to own the territory and own the cosmological maps they hand out about the way it is, like a Mayor Baba or something. It's a joke. It's like Trump claiming to be, be have been elected. He's the, he's the great wizard of Oz in this country. He's got so many people fooled. And it's the same, it's the same story. Muji's just a little Trump. <laughs> it's the same kind of narcissism. So the message is everywhere. When you have the ears to hear, you hear it everywhere. You hear it in the birds singing or your little critter pal coming to love on you. It's everywhere. I heard the birds, I heard your birds a, a minute ago outside your window. Yeah. They teach me all the time. They, they were healing me also <laughs> for years. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you think bad stuff happens to you and um, that you are not that because bad stuff happens to you and you go, what's truly bad? Because don't we learn from bad stuff, from difficulties? Like we wouldn't have looked into this probably if it wasn't for difficulties. We learn every day, I presume, and we mature more. Do you think that, um, did you have that um, also, I asked Robert something similar, where you um, liked your teacher very much to start with, and um, there was a gratefulness. To, and there was excitement with the message, but later on it became more like, almost like a subtle and you just matured in that, in that, in that wisdom. Was it such an experience for you or something similar or no? Yeah, I have met people where I was awestruck at first and then the ordinary comes in. But when I was with, with James in, in Jamaica, his vision of equality, his gaze of equality was so strong and so true I couldn't get beneath it to look up to him. It just was not possible. I couldn't look up to him. It was always mutual. Always we were sharing a mutual space. Never, never would he lord that over me. I never heard him use the word you. It was always I and I. It was never a you. It was never a preaching to me. And he was illiterate. He never heard of any of these people or any of this stuff. But he was like a a Ramana Maharshi or a Nityananda or one of the wild, the wild people we hear stories about living out of the wild. He was lived as the wild and uh, just an incredibly beautiful human being. Just incredibly beautiful.
I went to see him from time to time. I would go back and visit him through the years. Which was always a joy. And I, when I would meet him, it would be like no time was lost. It, it was just a continuation of the relationship I had with him. Nothing, not much had changed. He always met me exactly where I was. So you always felt equal with him. You did not feel like you were like a student and he was a teacher. It was that not true, probably, feeling no separation. It was just not, it was just not possible in his company. That's not how it worked. He served me like I was God. just wasn't possible. Mm. There was no kiss and feet or adoration or any of that kind of stuff at all. When no, I met no. others having that time, I met others in a like manner of, of an equality of vision rather than the hierarchical stance. People would see, put Muktananda on a pedestal. But when I met him, we were like even, level. We were eye and eye. Different. Others would go through all the guru stuff. So why is it that their message is different when they go on stage to how they live behind the stage? Um, why do they most put up the different message to what they really, I, I understand it's not experience to be shared, but why say you should be this way or that way when it is as it is? Um, all of us go through the pain, through some high and lows and up, downs what I've and downs. And... Is that they perform, they entertain. They have the stage name, they have the stage craft, they have the lights, they have an audience, they have the decor. It's all stagecraft. And then they perform in that environment. It's set up that way. It's just set up. They have a microphone. They have the flower, the vase. They have the, the soundtrack. <laughs> They've all got a soundtrack. The self-hypnosis is at work. Everybody's telling themselves, feel in, into the deep, the, the deep peace and the and, uh, and the silence and stuff and so everybody's getting all opened up and everything and, and then they project it onto the character who walks onto the stage. So it's no different than, a, than a Lady Gaga walking out and doing her thing and she's mesmerizing. She's good. It's just she doesn't glorify it. Not in that way. Her act is strong enough, she doesn't need that captive audience. So these people who glorify their entertainment as some spiritual or talk about God or something like that, they're no different than the Baptist preacher down here doing it every Sunday. It's a performance. But th their performance is rather weak. 
so they use this God stuff <laughs> to get a hook, get repeat business, get you to go bring your friends in like a pyramid scheme. It's just branding. Branding works. If you got a new twist on it, you get in the, in the mind first with a new little twist. You can position yourself in the, you can position in the mind of that seeker as owning this particular, this particular thing. It, it's kind of like the Ramana Maharshi people, they own self-inquiry. Who am I? It goes back to Ramana Maharshi started it, so they own the brand. What I have to say about it is, it's your own curiosity. You don't have to ask yourself, who am I? Or even use the words. It's a natural curiosity. Not a technique you got from Ramana Maharshi to be curious. It's it's inborn. The branded is self inquiry. There's something a little disingenuous about that. Now let me tell you how to do it. You don't have to tell me how to be curious. I'm already curious. No, you're not doing, you're not curious in the right way. Here's how you do it. You ask yourself, who am I? And here are all the steps that you do to do it. And then here you can read this booklet called Who Am I? And they brand, they brand the who am I? And then anybody else who comes after that in branding is going to build up that original brand. Now he's like a messiah in this non-dual crowd. He's just an ordinary guy, a sage, yes, but he's not this Messiah guy walking around. Yes. The branding. Yeah. Muktananda was Shakti Pot. Kundalini, he branded it. Mm he -hmm. was the first in the mind with that kind of talk. Then that gets into the mind, then they own that brand, then they become the owner. Well, Kundalini is just sexual energy. Every human being, every animal's got it, every tree's got it. It's energy, it's the east side of E equals MC square. That's marvelous. Yeah, it's not somebody else doesn't give it to you. Yeah, yeah, it's, mar it's marvelous. I mean, a human being is marvelous. The DNA code, a, a sperm and an oval, ovum fusing together is a little flash of light. That's marvelous. Grows a human being like you or I. That's truly a marvel beyond comprehension. And the way the, the, the brain, especially this part of the brain, blooms. And our ability for self-hypnosis and trancing and all that is marvelous, yes. It just comes with the package. I don't know how you bloom. I, I'm aware of my own bloom and appreciate how others may bloom, but they're no two exactly alike. So I'm not going... My flower is not going to look like Nityananda's flower or Muktananda's flower or Ramana Maharshi's flower. They flowered in their own way, in their own time, in their own culture, how they flowered. Copying it is silly. That's like a plastic flower. That's good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> isn't it like tricking people with kundalinis and really making them go wrong way um and the moment you 
put some certain clothes on yourself, believing you are special and you want to look special. If you have a different something that you wear, like spiritual clothes and I am higher than you are, isn't it the way you start off the, the circus and then, um, you know, and, and then they start feeding off each other, seekers and the teachers and um, it all goes wrong way and people expect Kundalini, people expect Shakti. I remember people would come to the meetings and have, would have a go at my teacher as they knew better than him. You know, I had a teacher who gave me Shakti and what's here, it's nothing, like you give me nothing. Yes, you get nothing here, <laughs> my teacher would say, you know, and no one wants nothing. No one wants to be nothing. No thing. Yeah, and um, they expect to feel better in the meetings and that's why they go back to get more, to get to feel better. No one feels better or good nonstop. It has to be up and down, two sides of the same coin, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. We, we wouldn't know what feeling good was if we never felt bad. Okay. Um, I just want to thank you for, um, for your message, which is really sharp and clear. And wishing you all the best to you and yours in the new year. And um, yeah, look after yourself and all the best. All right. Thank you so much, John. Yes, likewise.